Uh, we're going to head into the next talk here. Uh, Howard, are you here with us? Looks like Howard's getting back in. I think you're mute. There you are, Howard. Good. So I'm going to introduce Howard Stein, uh, also one of the uh, founding members of the society, uh, and he's going to give us a talk today called Uses of Applied Anthropological Poetry in These Times of Trouble in the U.S. and Worldwide. So go ahead and take it away, Howard. Well, first of all, I seem to be having computer problems or something because my mute and video keep coming on and off. So if I disappear, it may be a sign of both rapture and rupture. Um, so I, and I can't control a lot of things in my life. First of all, thank you for accepting this presentation. Um, I, I want to talk about a few so-called preliminary things before I read and discuss some poetry on our topic. First, today, the Spring Conference of 2021 is my 10th anniversary as your Poet Laureate. And uh, this has been one of the most important, pleasant, aspects of my life. And uh, I cannot thank you and your predecessors enough for um, giving me this voice, um, which also tells me in terms of our interaction over a lot of years, that you must recognize that there's some value in this voice for you and this voice, not just Howard Stein, but whatever contribution poetry or applied anthropological poetry might make as a way of complementing how we know, how we understand, how we work as applied anthropologists. So the second thing I want to say and we often say it only at the very end of a conference in thanking people A to Z who have put it all together. I'm, I'm doing this now for a couple of reasons. Um, all of this would not be possible were it not for the enormous work, part of which I've been privy to be part of and witness of Michael, Joseph, Melanie, Max, um, Lucor, uh, who am I? I need to look at other, do the arrow here. Um, oh, San Diego. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thanking you now because I want to, and I think it's important enough to do at the beginning and not just almost as an afterthought, but because it's part of our very topic, doing applied anthropology in shifting times. Well, you guys know this, this very meeting is an example of doing applied anthropology in shifting times. Um, if Anthony Wallace were looking at us, he would say, gee, this is a revitalization movement. Organizing the last year or more, virtual conferences, virtual planning meetings is a revitalization movement uh, between the, the age of Trump and the DNA entwined age of COVID-19 we had to reinvent ourselves, reinvent how we relate. Um, and so this, this, this very, this, this core group and other people too, uh, have been central to 
the resilience of our way of doing applied anthropology in meeting and planning and having conferences and retreats. So yes, thank you in particular for doing this, but thank you for being an example of the very thing that we're talking about. That's the, that's the topic of our conference. Um, shifting ground. The topic made me think of a period in Russian history called the Time of Troubles or uh, Smutnye Vremya from 1598 to 1613, the death of uh, Fyodor I of the House of Rurik, the last of the House of Rurik, and um, uh, Michael I of the House of Romanov. This period was one of lawlessness, uh, uh, enormous su suspiciousness, anarchy, killings, um, a lot of what was called then false Dimitris, people who were supposed to be imposters as, as the Tsars. Um, and all of this, and, and, and it was topped by a huge famine from 1601 to 63. And uh, this, this, this rang a lot of bells with me with the age of Donald Trump and even the transition supposedly to the presidency of Biden. Maybe uh, the Russian famine could have as a parallel the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it is a time of accusations and paranoia and questions about who is legitimate, who is illegitimate. So we have our birtherism all the way to the questioning now as to whether the election was legitimate, the outcome was legitimate, whether Biden is legitimate, which goes all the way back to Trump's birtherism as to whether uh, Barack Obama, long before he's president, was even a, a legitimate American uh, and therefore allowed to run for president. Uh, so th there, there are a lot of echoes for me of our shifting times and the time of troubles. And those of you who might be familiar with um, classical music, especially opera. The great opera Boris Godunov by Modest Mussorgsky was written about the time of troubles. And uh, Tsar Boris was one of these Romanovs who, who was caught in all of this chaos and um, he was accused and accused himself of killing the young Dimitri who was supposedly the true valid successor to the Tsar. And so this time of troubles and, and shifting times leads me to an opera. And that, oh God, this is, this is, this is, how weird Stein again, because everywhere, er, everything I think about anthropologically, psychodynamically, ultimately now leads me to art, whether to write poetry, read poetry, uh, to music, to, to visual art. And I have to remind myself why, why I am doing this and why you seem to have wanted it. Um, even before the 10 years when I was 
when I was reading poetry, in addition to presenting scholarly papers, um, it's like, what, what, what is it about that poetry and Howard's brand of poetry that rings some kind of bells that instead of you saying, go away, this is not anthropology, this is not applied anthropology, you ask for more. Now, at first I thought both I am crazy and you're crazy. So what I have concluded is that applied anthropological poetry is yet one other way of knowing, another form of ethnographic data. Um, uh, and, it, and, and a lot of people, including some psychoanalysts, often say uh, poetry and all the arts is in, are entirely internal. So all the poetry that Howard Stein writes, all the music that Mazursky writes, it's only about, Mazursky is only about Howard. Uh, it's not so. Because even our ethnographies that are about the outer world are always filtered through us, through our lives, through our subjectivity, through our intersubjectivity, what psychoanalysts call countertransference. Um, and even though I am not a, a member of every tribe, whether American Indian or corporate or medical, that I quote study and do applied work in, they get to me, I internalize them. I, I take their world in and in processing that, I come out with poetry that it turns out over a lot of years, when I give them the poems that I've written, a lot of times these people who are quote natives of so many different kinds of tribes will say, Howard, this is a very good picture of us, but how do you do this? You're a Jew Yankee from back East and, and you're now in Oklahoma and uh, I've come to label myself the only Jewish redneck I've ever met, but um, all of the knowledge, whether it is official ethnographic participant observation, interview stuff, or, or applied poetry or applied, applied music like Jesse does, um, we, all that we know, all that we do is filtered and processed through us. Let, let, me, let me go way, way out on a twig, not just a limb. Think of astronomers and think of microbiologists. I mean, sure, they're scientists. You look through a telescope or, or an electron or, or a uh, what do they call it, a radio telescope or a microscope or electron microscopes, and you're looking down at slides or looking way out there at stars. So obviously this is objective. This is, this is real science, right? Well, wait a second. The astronomer is looking with his or her eyes, which means his or her brain, his or her life, his or her religion, ethnic group, rapture, rupture, continuity, discontinuity. And so the galaxy that she or he sees or the theory that he or she proposes comes from not only what comes from the, the first lens to the final lens, but from the astronomer looking into the tel telescope. Same thing with a microscope. I mean, everything isn't just what I see on the slide. What I see on the slide, 
God help me, is in part what I project. Uh, so a lot of times in human cultural life, um, we not only perceive, we project. You know, some of the major theories of religion talk about religion as a projective system. So why not use that projection, taking in from the outside, the telescope, the microscope, the gosnoscope. And since we, we know we process it through our lives, why not use that? And so that, no, I am not a native of this corporation or of this hospital. But working with people, identifying with them, having empathy, you, you know all of the, the feelings as well as cognitive stuff. Um, all of that inspires poems in me. And that's, that's where the poetry comes from. Um, so the poetry isn't just a product of Howard Stein. It is a product of them in me them processed by me, return to them. It is, a, it is a continuous cycle, maybe even a virtuous spiral where I'm working with a group, I write a poem, hand the poem to them, we discuss things. It makes them think and do other things. It makes me write another poem. And this becomes part of our applied work. So the poetry might not be a lineal strategic plan. The poetry is one of these things of creating space, facilitating space, facilitating space in which something new, creative, unthought of before might emerge. Oh, I've gotten criticized. I've got sledgehammered by colleagues who say, you know, Howard, you, you may have interesting poems, but we can't use it. But there are some people who do because they know how to. It's not, it's not, it's like, it's not like using a plunger in a stuffed up toilet where you press and press and press and then you flush and it goes down. Boy, if this is being recorded, this is gonna be quite funny. Um, so the, ro the role of poetry, the role of any of the arts is not lineal, it's not direct. It's, it's like what Emily Dickinson said long, long time ago. Tell the truth, but tell it slant. And all art is slant, it's indirect. And we discover something new that we hadn't known before. And I'm, I have a watch right in front of me and I'm losing track of time. So I'm gonna ask you to please help me be honest. I wanna read a few poems about the shifting times as I embody them and as they, as they write me, and, and I have to explain there in terms of the dynamics. If I'm a poet, that means I write poetry, right? Well, so much of the time I feel like I am written rather than I write. I mean, I sit down and I will write a poem. I'm in the middle of doing something and some lines float in from God knows where. And you know, the, the message comes from wherever. It says, sit down and get your tablet out and start writing on this. And so do I write? Am I the creator or am I written? Is writing a poem about some ethnographic subject, about some applied subject, is, about a re is it about a relationship or is it only about me? Okay. 
I had a poem published this last year in a book on immigration edited by Irene Willis. It's called Unclaimed. I show up on your doorstep. You decline even to greet me, but only say as your index finger part points far away, you do not belong, you are not from here. You can never be one of us. I see in her eye and in her forearms, locked tightly against her chest, that she will never claim me as related to her in any way. Dejected, I turn to leave. But say first to her, looking into her frozen face, I am the stranger you once were and fear again to be. You were unclaimed and cannot recognize yourself once more in me. <laughs> Some part of all of us was once unwanted. That's not in the poem. And the walls and the expulsions and the ethnic cleansing that Peter talked about, they're horrible things that we do to them, but they gotta be part of us that we cannot possibly tolerate in ourselves. A couple haiku. Uh, this first one comes from the great drought in Oklahoma, North Texas, West Kansas, uh, the 1930s. Dry earth caked and cracked. This drought could last forever. Gratitude for rain. Living um, over 40 years in Oklahoma, one of the things I've learned from lots of people I've worked with, rural and urban, it's almost a sin to say, we've gotten too much rain. We, 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 need, we need a break, we need a stop. Why? Because the Great Depression, the Great Drought, is one of these cultural traumas passed on generation to generation. And we know what no rain whatsoever feels like. And although we hate floods, we hate drownings, all that. Drought is always worse. The next little tiny haiku you'll get immediately. Oh, by the way, a haiku, it has a stringent structure of five beats to the first line, seven to the second, five to the third. Have you seen my mom? Our borders are not secure. We are all afraid. The last little haiku comes from a haunted and haunting Jewish experience on November 9th and November 10th, 1938. In Nazi Germany, it became called Kristallnacht in which uh, Hitler and company didn't order Germans to ransack, burn, kill Jews, destroy synagogues, Jewish shops, but they and police and fire departments and everybody stood by as this took place. And every November 9th and 10th, lots of Jewish folks kind of remember, even though they're not there 
it kind of gets passed on as a trauma. Anniversary, November 9, Kristallnacht, the old fear returns. Um, a lot of our discussion and presentations have been about outcast groups, sometimes called, quote, minority groups, people of color. There's all kinds of different names for the them, the, quote, capitalized other. It's a poem called Them. I am a them to you. The banishment is in your eyes. In the distance you stand from me. In the frown on your face when I am the object of your gaze. How not to make your judgment my own and become a them to me? Michael, in your introductory talks, talk, you spoke of the importance of resilience in the midst of crisis and so much terrible things going on. I agree completely. I mean, isn't a flight anthropologist, apologist, and I hope as a human being, I try to help people develop resistance, resilience, resistance too. That's, that's what resi <laughs> resilience is, resistance to despair in the midst of despair. I also think it's important in the middle of shifting sands and shifting tectonic plates to look right straight at what is happening. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote in his play, No Exit, human life begins on the far side of despair, acknowledging loss, acknowledging earthquakes, acknowledging mourning, um, bearing witness to it, uh, saying this really happened. I think it's an important part of the journey, bumpy journey toward resilience. And that inspired a little poem that is very bitter. It's called Syllogism. Your intimidating words continue to ring in my ears long after you have hurled them. They felt like a beating and my soul still smarts just because you say you don't remember doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Now, I'm hoping that at least some of these poems will resonate with your own life as tuning forks. I don't want you to say, Howard, those were nice poems, let's move on. It'll really make me feel validated if you can say, oh shit, this reminds me of my life. You just, your poem was just my story. And I say that at this point with this poem, because I bet with every one of our 12, 13, however many people are here, every one of you has experienced a kind of a denial, a kind of uh, a disavowal of something that happened that, that you know it happened and other people tell you it didn't happen. Lord knows the age of Trump is full of this. Uh, <laughs> Black Lives Matter, well, that was totally disposed of, discounted. Um, 
I'm going to read an organizational. Well, um, where am I with time? You're going to kill me. Um, we got about 10 minutes of your Q&A left. Oh, okay. You have time to read. You have time to read. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I totally mistrust my sense of history or of time. As so should we all. Um, let's talk about boxes. One of the things over the past 10, 15, 20 years that spread like wildfire in organizations is this slogan that to be, a, be creative, you got to think outside the box. And that's, that's in mission statements and that's in the folklore, that's in stories. But I bet every one of you 12, 13, 14 people have experiences in various kinds of organizations, maybe even in your families, where even though it might be on the wall in the mission statement, think outside the box. God forbid if you think outside the box because you're sledgehammered, how dare you go against tradition? How dare you go against uh, our box? So a real snotty poem called Who We Are. A matrix of sacred cliches proclaims to the world, this is we, the way we do things around here. And don't mess with it. We don't think of thinking outside the box. We are the box. Have you ever worked with people in organizations doing consulting, doing planning, doing whatever? And um, instead of people listening to each other, not just you, um, they have an answer even before you finish what you're saying, or somebody has an answer before somebody else finishes what they're saying, or they're making up an answer while somebody else is still talking. Thoughts geography, tiny poem. Before, before I have a thought, you know what mine should be. You can't seem to occupy yourself without first occupying me. I want to skip. Um, I, I want to read a poem inspired, inspired by my work in Oklahoma with, for a lot of years with the American Indian Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, now, one of the things a lot of American Indians, Native Americans teach people who are white, and I still don't know whether Jews are white. There's an argument about that. Certainly the riots in Charlottesville didn't seem to think that Jews were white. But a lot of people over lots of years have pretended to speak in behalf of Indians and feel entitled to. And a lot of American Indians have gotten very angry, very pissed and say, you don't, you don't write us, we write us. And so I've angered a few people with this poem, but just as I write about people I work with all the time, everybody, there were a lot of people, American Indians, who heard this poem and said, oh my God, yeah, that's, that's my life. This poem is not only inspired by my working in Oklahoma with American Indian tribes, but by Deward Walker's talks years and years and years ago. Y not only years ago, but years and year after year, and Rich Stoffel and Jack Schultz. 
Now, on the one hand, there's a lot of trail of tears where people are exiled, forced, frozen and beaten to death from Florida, North Carolina, the way to Oklahoma. There's another kind of exile. This one's called exile in situ, a protest soliloquy. What we have long called home, you call wilderness, to do with as you please. You defiled our ancestral land. You profaned our sacred trails. You poisoned our earth and our streams with your atomic waste. You made us homeless in our own homes. You uprooted us in space and time. You sowed chaos in the universe. How do we repair what you have broken. Can our ceremonials and offerings bind the earth together once again? Is renewal even possible? What holy power can fend you off? Is there a medicine bundle that can heal us? I want to go to the very end to a couple of poems that I hope offer a little resilience. And uh, I'm gonna go way to the end of our day where we have a, a poetry workshop. And between now and then, I, I hope and pray that a few phrases from people's presentations or something that they say that reminds you of something in your life and work might inspire you to write a few lines or a poem or an idea or, or anything uh, that you might bring to that workshop to, to read and discuss. And, we, and with your permission, uh, we can all discuss it, partly as a way of processing our entire conference and not just your, your poem. Because that time is a very special sacred time that belongs to everybody. This is not Howard Stein's private property. I hope you're all familiar with a, with a very brief comedy routine by Bud Abbott and Lou Costello called Who's on First? Because I have a poem that I wrote it's called Who's on First Revisited? And I'm going to make a lot of assumptions, but I hope you know what I'm referring to. Who's on First Revisited? What if Bud Abbott and Lou Costello's vaudeville comedy routine, Who's on First, was taken to serious stuff that drives you nuts each time it occurs? Not just something to laugh at, that is happening to them. So many times it is restaged in my head as ordinary life, nothing comical about it. Who's on first? Is it a question or an observation about a first baseman in baseball? Neither Abbott nor Costello can or will hear the distinction or at least acknowledge the ambiguity Abbott, the straight man, understated, matter of fact, Costello, an excitable, volatile partner who becomes confused to distraction each time Abbott applies. When did angle become fact? Digging one's heels the only way to settle a dispute. When two people or groups or nations cannot will not listen to the other, they hear only echoes of their own voices, intransigence, spawns, frozen misunderstanding, headstrong certainty reappears as irrefutable, irrefutable fact. Uh, these days it's called alter, uh, alternative facts. Who's on first, interrogative or declarative? Inflection should have the final say. Seems so obvious. Dare I imagine hearing it the way you hear it? Asking 
you how you hear it. Certainly not. I could lose my footing. Exasperation soars because so much is at stake in being right. And in convincing others, there's only one way of understanding mine. This argument could go on forever. Each escalating round louder and louder, ever more desperate. My final poem. Um, you know, when I write poems and when I am written, these are emotional, not just word experiences. When I wrote this poem a couple of years ago, by the time it ended, I was sobbing. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes from my work with doctors, my, my billions of years in therapy, because you all know I'm not some a poet after all. This is called Dialogue. And this will be my final poem. And if there's time for discussion, I, I encourage us now and in the session later, not only to talk to me, 